All right. Good afternoon. Welcome. Dr. McGowan here. We are live in Cary, North Carolina with the True You Weight Loss team. And I will be performing a live full-length ESG, endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, right now. This is a big day for us. It's actually a major milestone. This is our 2,000th ESG patient, which is a big deal for us. We've achieved a lot in the past few years, and I think a big advance for the field. So uh, we're celebrating that by broadcasting this live on all the platforms you're watching on. And we have a few goals, a few priorities that I'll just establish right away. First of all, this is a medical procedure, so safety is a priority. So we're, if we need to cut off or um, turn this off briefly to attend to our patient at any point, we'll do that. Second priority is to make a perfect ESG for this patient so she can do her absolute best. Third is we're going to have fun doing it, and hopefully it's fun for all of you watching. And number four is just education. So ask questions. I'll be fielding any questions or comments that you have throughout this entire procedure, which should be about 45 minutes long. So punch those questions and comments in whatever platform you're watching on, and we will do our best to answer them. We have a team who is uh, fielding those, and we'll be uh, relaying them to me. Okay. So we're going to start the ESG procedure. By the way, our patient today, uh, pretty typical of a patient that we would see who's interested in the ESG procedure. She uh, has gained weight since adulthood and has really struggled to lose it. She's tried every fad diet you could imagine, and of course they don't work. And she's not interested in surgery, and that's a common theme that we hear, uh, afraid of the risks, and, and we know that. Surgery is the best treatment for obesity, but we know many people aren't interested in it. So this field of endoscopic bariatrics is really opening up new and effective treatment options for people not interested in actual surgery. And so we're going to walk through what the ESG involves um, from start to finish. So just to begin, so this is an endoscopic procedure, meaning it's done with an endoscope, which is a flexible scope with a high-definition camera on the end, and it's done through the mouth, so no incisions. That's the biggest difference between this and a surgical sleeve. We're using uh, a dual-channel scope, so it has two working channels that run through it, so we can put tools through the scope. And this is the Fuji, uh, the latest Fuji scopes, which are pretty slick scopes that we, we've enjoyed. Um, attached to the scope is the Apollo ESG device, so this is the suturing system that allows us to do this procedure. This is FDA authorized for the treatment of uh, adults with obesity. And I'll show you how that works, but basically this attaches to our scope. It has a needle, a curved needle on the end, and I can control that needle right here with this handle. So it's a, it's a very advanced device. All right, we're gonna get started here. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce this scope uh, into the patient's mouth, and I'll kind of walk through this process as we go. So I'm going down the esophagus here. And by the way, our patient is asleep. She's intubated. Jason here is managing her anesthesia, and so she's comfortable and, and safe throughout this procedure. So I've just entered down the esophagus into the stomach. And she has really a nice, normal stomach. And on the end of the scope is our suturing system. There's just a little bit of mucus there from the esophagus. We'll rinse some of that off. But there's a needle and thread you can kind of see here. It'll make more sense as we go. But I'm controlling that needle and suture material right here at, at the scope. So the basic, basic concept of the ESG is we're, gonna, we're going to suture the, uh, what we call the greater curve, or the one wall of the stomach to make it into a narrow sleeve-like shape. I'm going to start at the bottom and work my way all the way up to the top. We don't go all the way, and I'll explain that later on, but basically uh, the majority of the stomach, the, the front wall, anterior wall of the stomach, we will suture, and the end result is a stomach that's about 80% smaller when we're finished. And that's how this patient's going to be able to eat less, not feel overly hungry, and lose weight over time. Okay, so that's the overview. So I have this suturing system attached. Just to mention two other devices that are a part of this. This is called the anchor exchange. It's basically a needle uh, holder. This allows me to hand the needle back and forth as I'm suturing in the stomach. And then we have a helix device, which allows me to grab the stomach and pull it towards the scope so I can then pass the needle through. So those are the main tools that we'll be utilizing. All right, and I'm just going to start this process, and then we'll start taking questions uh, as we go. So everything is loaded and ready. And I also have a foot pedal, which allows me to rinse the stomach and irrigate the stomach if needed. Now, by the way, there is a little bit of bleeding during this procedure. It's normal. The stomach has a rich blood supply. It's magnified on the view that you're seeing. It's really not very much, but that's completely normal. But just be aware if, uh, you know, because you will be seeing that. So we start at the bottom of the stomach at the level of what's called the incisura, kind of right here. You see this ridge. 
And so actually, Roche, uh, this is Roche, by the way, uh, the world's most experienced ESG technician. And so he'll be driving the helix during this procedure. Go ahead and pop that out for a second so we can see. So this is basically a corkscrew type device that will grab into the stomach wall and allow me to pull it towards the scope. So I'm going to position that. Roche is going to, go ahead. And he's going to turn that. And I'll be able to pull that towards the scope. And at this point, I can close the handle and drive the needle through. And so our goal here is to place full thickness sutures. These are going all the way through the stomach wall. That's really critical for this procedure so that this will last and remain durable and everything will hold in place and heal. So there you can see the first suture or stitch was placed. So that's the front wall of the stomach. I'm going to work my way down to the posterior wall, the back wall of the stomach, taking a series of stitches or bites along the way. So we'll go right here. And so this is a somewhat repetitive process as we slowly reduce the size of the stomach. And so from start to finish, we'll use, depending on the size of the stomach, an average of six to eight sutures. I can talk more about that later on. My goal here in general, though, is to fit in as many sutures as I possibly can. It's really important because the sutures are holding the stomach uh, in the beginning. It's essential that we, we put enough and that they're placed properly. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and take our third bite here. So as Roche is dialing that helix forward, I'm kind of pulling the stomach towards me. That creates separation from any surrounding structures. So that's really critical for safety. So my two priorities here are to ensure full thickness with every bite that I take and to ensure we're not capturing any other surrounding structures. And if, if those two conditions are met right here, um, then we know this will be safe and effective. So that speaks to the technical side of this. So I'm just working my way down from the front wall to the back wall. And probably what I'll do is finish this suture and then start asking, answering some questions right here. So I'm cautious to not make the stomach too narrow. You know, our patient needs to be able to tolerate liquids and eventually solids as, as she transitions her diet along. So we want to leave uh, basically a channel at the end that will allow the scope to pass, um, but should be fairly snug against the scope. So this is a little technical, but our suture pattern in general is going to follow a basic U shape. I'm coming down from front wall to back wall, across, and then back up. So it's a general accepted suture pattern in, the, in our field. So I've completed the downward uh, path. You can see how that stomach is just really coming together from the suture. And now I'm coming across. So we'll go right here. And I'll probably have to grab that again. Right there. Okay. So pulling in the tissue and closing the handle, and that drives the needle through. On, on my side, I'm able to feel uh, basically a click or a small crunch, which tells me the needle has passed through all layers of the stomach. That's really important feedback for me, so I can ensure that every stitch is placed full thickness. And now I'm just making my way back up in this U-type configuration. That serves an important purpose, this shape, the suture pattern we're doing, because once I tighten the suture down, the stomach will be both shorter and narrower with each suture that we place. And, and so it's really this sleeve-like, scrunched-up stomach shape in the end. So just continuing the process here. Okay. Go ahead. Generally, I'll take about um, five to six bites on the way down and on the way back up. So we're really trying to anchor this suture uh, with numerous uh, bites, and, and that's going to ensure the, the best durability. Okay. So we're getting back to where we started, so the suture's nearly finished. And each time I close the handle, I can feel a nice click and crunch, and I, I know that you know every one of these is full thickness, which is just critical. Here. Okay. So I've come all the way back to the top. So at this point, that suture is finished. What we need to do is cinch it down. So this is a pretty neat device. The needle tip, what has been the needle tip, I will now drop with this blue button, and that becomes an anchor point. You can see that right there. So one end of our suture is anchored by the needle tip, basically like a little metal tag. And on the other end, we're going to lock it in with something called a cinch. So Roche is going to load that now. The cinch is basically like a little plastic plug that will lock the other side. And so this suture is not dissolvable. It will remain in the stomach wall permanently, and, but, it, but it's safe to remain in there long term. And this is a normal amount of just minor bleeding that we see during this procedure. 
Once I cinch down this suture, all of that will stop. So I'm advancing the cinch device. And there you can see it. So there's a little white plug at the tip and kind of a white ring. As Roche deploys this, it will pull the ring, excuse me, it will pull the plug into the ring and that will lock and cut the suture. So I'm gonna position myself here, pull in all the suture slack. So I want this nice and snug. Not too tight, but uh, right about there. So we'll go ahead and cinch that. And so that's one suture complete. And then the process will continue another five, six, or seven times probably for this patient. All right, so I'm just going to clean up a little. And I think if there's any questions or comments, Colleen will go ahead and start asking those. Our first question is from Dave on Facebook. How long does the surgery take? Thanks, Dave. Uh, Dave asking how long this will take. In general, it, it kind of depends. In our practice, um, average of anywhere between 30 and 60 minutes. Uh, depends on a few factors. The size of the stomach, um, the experience of the endoscopist. Uh, I would say average an hour or so, kind of nationally. But that's a good question. Our goal is not to go fast. We don't want to rush anything. But the more efficient we can be, uh, which comes with experience, the less time our patient's under anesthesia, which does help with the recovery. All right, so I'm loading my next suture. Suture number two. So you can see here now a, a much more clear view of how I'm loading the suture, opening the handle, and you can see that needle there, that curved needle that will drive through the stomach wall. Okay, uh, I'll take another question if you have one. Okay, our next question is how much weight can the average patient expect to lose from ESG? So average weight loss with ESG. Uh, so we, we generally speak in percentages. I think that's the best way to look at this, a percent of total body weight that you'll lose. So what percent of your starting weight will you lose with this procedure? Uh, and in general, in our practice, it's about 20 to 21% of body weight. If you look um, at all available studies of ESG compiled, uh, what's called a meta-analysis, it's around 17% of body weight. So if you compare that to, you know, we often compare to diet and exercise, which is maybe one or two or three percent of body weight, it's significantly more. Uh, anything above 10% has a major impact on your overall health and comorbidities and, and metabolic conditions. So average, though, about 20% is what we see. You can keep rolling with them if you have more. Yep. All right, our next question is from BJ on Facebook. What happens to the part of the stomach that you're closing off? Okay, question from BJ, thank you. Yeah, so really common question. So we're folding the stomach together. We're really not excluding anything. There's no channel behind this. We're just uh, bunching the stomach up and, and sewing it together. So really all this will heal together and um, there's no excluded area. There are no pockets. Food won't get stuck in there. Uh, functionally, it's a normal stomach uh, in the end. It's just smaller in capacity. And I'm just making my way down here on the second suture. And you can, if you have another question, sure. Next question. I hear a lot of people talk about restriction with ESG. What exactly does this mean and how long does it last? Yeah, so question about restriction. Really common question we get. We don't love the word restriction. Um, really, in general, with this procedure, with any weight loss procedure, surgery, any balloons, anything, we really don't want to eat to the point of restriction, which to me would imply over, over full um, right here. Uh, so really, we want to work on eating to satisfaction. It's, an, it's a critical principle when we're talking about uh, this weight loss journey. So in our program, our dietitians work with our patients to really, um, of course, optimize nutrition, but working on portion size. And, and a big part of this is eating slowly, mindfully, uh, to the point of satisfaction and then stopping. If you're relying on a procedure to stop you physically from eating, to immediately stop you from eating, it just, it really won't happen. Uh, no procedure or surgery can really accomplish that. So it's, it's actually a really important discussion uh, on how we frame the feeling of fullness after this type of procedure. All right, we'll cinch there. So second suture is done. We'll go ahead and cinch. Go ahead, Colleen. All right, this is a, this is a loaded question from Heather okay. on YouTube. If your patient had stomach issues or suspicious growths, what would you do? If a patient has stomach issues or? Suspicious growths. Suspicious growths. Oh, so this gets to the question of someone comes in for the procedure and we go in to do it and could we find something that would preclude us from doing it? It's never happened in our program. So it's very unlikely. In reality, if you came to see us and were interested in this procedure and you had a lot of stomach symptoms, underlying conditions, that you know, we would evaluate that. We'd certainly want to make sure your stomach is healthy beforehand. But the truth is, for someone without symptoms who's otherwise healthy, it's exceedingly unusual to find anything abnormal in the stomach that would prevent us from doing this procedure. 
So just going ahead to cinch our second suture. Exact same process. So you might have noticed I used a slightly different suture pattern on this suture. Go ahead and cinch here. So my general preference is to have uh, alternating sutures, a U followed by a straight line, and then a U, and then another straight line. That allows me to fit more sutures in the stomach. Uh, and, and really, I think, creates a stronger construct in the end, a stronger ESG. And again, trying to fit as many sutures as I can in here, within reason. So second suture is done. I'm able to pass the scope through here. Uh, it is snug, but we're able to go right on through. And that's what I'm looking for. You can't really see the sleeve forming yet. As we do the next one or two sutures, you'll start to see it taking a sleeve-like shape, though. Okay, I'll take another question. All right, next question is from BW on YouTube. How has your technique changed as you've gotten more experience? BW on YouTube, thank you, asking how my technique has changed. It's really changed a lot. So we started uh, doing this procedure 2018. It's been uh, quite a long time, obviously 2,000 procedures at this point. Uh, there's a really steep learning curve when you're learning this procedure, but even after my first 500 or even 1,000 procedures, I feel like we've made uh, incremental advances. Probably the biggest thing for me uh, is just the ability to make sure that every single stitch is full thickness. That's really challenging in the beginning, uh, and that's something that's become much easier at this point. We've varied and tweaked our suture patterns along the way, and we track all of our patients' data, and so we can see, we can actually see really real time how our patients are responding to some of these changes we make along the way. So at this point, I feel confident that we're at a place where this procedure is performing a, a, really as well as it can. All right, so we're starting our third suture. What I'm doing is really just following the stomach, uh, the same kind of line backwards, but narrowing the stomach as we go. And uh, some people will mark this with uh, argon plasma to begin with, which is what we, we used to do previously, um, not really necessary at this point. Okay, go ahead. Uh, sure, go ahead. So does this procedure keep me from being hungry or does it just make it so I can eat less? So does the procedure keep you from being hungry? Or does it, so, uh, yes. So if we were just uh, doing a procedure and putting you on a restricted diet without affecting your appetite or sense of satiety, it would be a mess right here. Uh, so this has a much more impact than just physically reducing the size of the stomach. And truthfully, we don't fully even understand all of the impacts from a metabolic standpoint. But hunger is definitely diminished after this procedure. Um, for quite some time, you know, in reality, the main mechanism of the ESG procedure is, is not just a smaller stomach. It actually affects the motility, the emptying of the stomach, and that's probably the primary mechanism. So when you eat, food stays in longer, significantly longer, uh, on the order of 80% longer, uh, for quite some time, even a year and a half, the stomach empties more slowly. So what happens is when you eat, food stays in the stomach, you feel more satisfied, it takes longer to empty, uh, and then your, so your hunger is diminished throughout that time. So yes, uh, the flip side of that is we are not re surgically removing any part of the stomach. So if you compare this to a surgical sleeve, that is a key difference. With a surgical sleeve, a large portion of the stomach is removed, including the top of the stomach, where the primary hunger hormone is produced. So there is certainly a more significant decrease in hunger following that procedure. But yes, this does affect hunger, appetite, fullness, all of that. Next question is from Ken Lee on Facebook. Is it possible for sutures to rip or rupture after the procedure? The question is, is it possible for sutures to rip or rupture? Uh, certainly, uh, that is possible. Uh, however, by making sure they're full thickness, these are really strong. The sutures themselves really wouldn't break. Uh, if the suture is not placed full thickness, it could pull through into the stomach. And so that relates to the technique. It's really critical that each stitch is placed full thickness. If that happens, I'm, you know, if we're achieving that, I'm really confident nothing's going to happen to these sutures. In fact, it's really fascinating to us to see if you go back in a patient's stomach in a year or longer after this procedure, you can't even see the sutures. Everything's healed together. It's covered with fresh lining of the stomach. Uh, you see these bridges of uh, mucosa and, and really fibrosis is what we're causing. So the sutures after time are probably less relevant overall. I'll take another question if you have it. Uh, we're just making our way uh, back from the back wall to the front wall here on the third suture. Next question is, who's a good candidate for this procedure? So who is a good candidate for this procedure? 
Well, really anyone who has struggled to lose weight, has tried diet and exercise and not succeeded, uh, perhaps who isn't interested in surgery uh, and looking for other options, anyone, anyone who fits those criteria could be a candidate. In general, we would say uh, a BMI between 30 and 50, that is the FDA indication for this device, but the procedure can be safely performed outside of those bounds as well. What I would look for in a patient is someone who is motivated, who's ready for a change, who really feels that this is the procedure for them, who's ready to work with our team for the next year or more, that's a great candidate. Yeah. Okay, next question is from Queen Jared on TikTok. How long after the procedure is it safe to conceive? How long is it safe to conceive? Okay, so yeah, pregnancy after this procedure, great question. So it's safe uh, fairly soon, but we would of course recommend waiting. You're on a weight loss journey, uh, in general, we'd say weight a year would be reasonable. Uh, you're trying to lose weight. It takes about a year to get to your lowest weight. Um, but from a safety standpoint, there's really no major impact. So it's certainly safe. The other thing to consider is that oftentimes fertility increases after a weight loss procedure. As you're losing weight, uh, it has an impact on fertility, ovulation. Um, and so uh, that's something to be aware of because we've certainly had uh, many patients who uh, previously were not able to conceive and were after losing weight with ESG. Next question, can you tell us how our, what, sorry, what should we expect from a diet plan after this procedure? Are there certain things you can and can't eat? So diet plan after ESG. So the beginning stages are very similar to any bariatric diet. So what we're doing is a liquid diet, clear liquids. What we recommend in our program is clear liquids for two days, then what we call full liquids for two weeks. That's basically protein shakes. The emphasis the first two weeks is protein, it's everything. After that, we slowly transition through a solid diet phase towards regular food. So by six to eight weeks, you're eating regular food. And that means really a full variety of foods. There are no major restrictions. In fact, we like to say there are no never foods. You can eat a full variety. Of course, we're going to tailor and recommend a certain plan, a, really a balanced macro plan. And so it's about balanced, nutritious food and portion control. Really the only thing we'd suggest, there's two things we recommend avoiding long-term alcohol, probably for at least a year. Alcohol is very detrimental to any weight loss efforts. And carbonated drinks, we just don't need that extra gas and distension of the stomach. And we're uh, cinching up the third suture now. So moving along pretty well here. Okay. I think after this suture, and certainly the next, it will really be taking on a sleeve-like shape. And so I'm just pulling in all the slack here, and Roche will cinch that up. I'll take another question if you have it. All right, next question is from DC Mapile on TikTok. What's the advantage of ESG over a balloon procedure? The question from TikTok, what's the advantage of ESG over a balloon? So first of all, I wouldn't say there's an advantage per se. I mean, these are all good tools. These are all different tools. Uh, it's really about what works the best or is the best fit for an individual. Uh, in general, though, the weight loss is uh, more predictable um, and, and greater with the ESG procedure. With a balloon, the average weight loss is, depending on the studies you're looking at or the program you're in, somewhere between 10 and 15% of body weight. It's about 15% in our program. Uh, with ESG, as I mentioned, it's 20% in our program, so that's a comparison in terms of weight loss. Uh, there's no question ESG is easier to recover from for most people. Balloons can be a little bit rough in the, in the beginning. Um, there's just some, seems to be more symptoms, and they can be ongoing, whereas with ESG, they, once they resolve, they resolve. So those are big differences. Just from a procedural technical standpoint, this is uh, a longer term procedure, obviously, we're suturing the stomach, whereas the balloon is reversible. So you don't have that support from the balloon after the six months or so that you have it. But a balloon can be a good option for someone who wants a completely reversible procedure. Uh, that, that's an important point. All right, right there. Okay. Next question is from Angeline on TikTok. What's the downtime after this procedure? What is recovery like? Okay, question about downtime. That's one of the advantages of ESG is the, the shorter downtime. So it's actually fairly brief. We generally say two to three days of downtime, returning to work, maybe in three to five days. Uh, most of the symptoms are just a day or two uh, after this procedure, and that's mostly gas pressure, bloating, cramping, maybe some nausea. 
it does improve quite rapidly. Um, so low energy, maybe for a couple more days, but within a week or so, you know, everyone's feeling, should be feeling quite great. Uh, with a surgical sleeve or surgical procedure, it's longer. You know, there's incisions, there's about six weeks of healing time. So that is a key distinction. This question is from Dave on Facebook. Does a patient come back at any point for follow-up evaluation? Question about follow-up after the procedure. Follow-up is more important than the procedure. It's really, really critical is the aftercare that you receive after a procedure like this or a surgery or any other weight loss endeavor. You can't just have a procedure. Uh, it, you just, it's not going to work as well for you. So uh, in our program, you know, we invest heavily in aftercare. We see our patients numerous times. So our patients, and the beauty is we can do a lot virtually these days, and it makes it really easy for patients to follow up. So we see our patients essentially monthly for the first year after this procedure, and then ongoing support thereafter. Uh, it's really, really important so we can make sure everything's going as it should. We can make adjustments along the way, offer support, and offer accountability really both ways. You can keep going, sure. Next question is from Flo on LinkedIn, who wants to know, do adhesions occur over time with this procedure? So Flo asked about adhesions after this procedure. Well, not really external to the stomach. Assuming we're being safe and avoiding grabbing anything external with our needle, there would be no external adhesion. So that's an advantage uh, of this procedure. This is uh, it's a stomach sparing procedure. We're not altering the stomach, and we can access the stomach if needed ever in the future. Um, but we are kind of causing, I wouldn't call them adhesions, but it's this fibrosis effect that we're, we're inducing by suturing the stomach, which allows it to stay in a smaller configuration longer term. Mm -hmm. Next question's from Lakeisha on Facebook. Does ESG last a lifetime? Does ESG last a lifetime? No procedure lasts a lifetime, unfortunately. So this is a great tool, but no, nothing lasts a lifetime, even the most involved invasive surgeries like gastric bypass. Um, ideally, this procedure would be the tool to allow you to make the changes that will last a lifetime, though. We're cinching up suture number four. It's looking like she'll need maybe seven sutures, but we'll see as we go. So stomach's starting to take its sleeve-like shape. We're about halfway up the stomach with four sutures, and that's pretty typical. Now, I will suture all the way up to the level of where the esophagus is, and, but I, then I'll stop. So we don't want to suture the very top of the stomach, which is called the fundus, uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, it's a thinner walled area. It's actually quite thin, just a few millimeters, so there's a little bit greater risk. Uh, but more importantly, we're intentionally leaving this cap on the top of the stomach, really like a, a small pouch, so that when you eat, food will stay there, that top of the stomach stretching causes your brain to register satiety and fullness, and then that will slowly empty through this slower emptying system. So it's actually an intentional uh, decision for us to not suture all the way up. So it's slightly different in shape than a surgical sleeve. Censure? Okay. Are you able to perform this procedure on patients who have already had bariatric surgery but have regained their weight? So can this be performed in patients who have had prior bariatric surgery? It can. Uh, so someone who's had a sleeve gastrectomy, a surgical sleeve, and maybe has regained weight and things can stretch over time, we can go in and perform this exact same procedure. It's basically like a mini ESG. If you've had a gastric bypass, there is a related procedure uh, called a transoral outlet, outlet reduction or TOR procedure. It's a little bit different, but uses the same device uh, to accomplish that. So, but bottom line, yes, there are newer tools like this that can address weight regain uh, for someone who's had prior surgery. And I'm starting our fifth suture now. OK. Hmm? Next question is from IVE Life on TikTok. What are the disadvantages with ESG? Question, what are the disadvantages of ESG? Uh, there's, uh, yeah, that's a great question. So um, things to consider. It is, this is not, it does not have the same impact as a surgical sleeve. So I mentioned the 20 to 21% weight loss that we see with, surg with uh, ESG. A surgical sleeve, it's more like 25 to 30%. So there's greater weight loss with a surgical procedure. You have to consider that. You have to weigh all of your options. Um, so that would be potentially a downside. It's a little bit less weight loss. And I already mentioned the impact on hunger. There's a longer lasting impact of hunger on, on hunger with a surgical procedure. 
Uh, there's other potential downsides, which is right now cost. And the truth is right now insurance does not cover this routinely. I'm sure that question has come up. Go ahead here. And so uh, right now this is not covered by insurance, and so you need to be aware of that. Uh, that is uh, certainly in the works, but it takes many years for that to occur. Next question is from Roja Cobbs 3 on TikTok. Can a, dia can a diabetic get this procedure? Question, can a diabetic get this procedure? Absolutely. In fact, uh, this procedure is uh, quite effective for improving and reversing diabetes. Uh, so the, the weight that you'll lose, uh, we see improvement in glucose control. So many of our patients have reduced or completely come off of their diabetes medications, seen improvement in A1C, and that's been shown in, in uh, studies as well. So uh, absolutely, uh, really, and we focus on the scale, but in reality, this is about improving health. So with this procedure, we see uh, improvement in diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Uh, and, and again, that's, that's really what it's about. Next question's from Heather on YouTube. Is this procedure reversible? Question, is this procedure reversible? Theoretically, yes, um, but uh, in reality, you probably, there wouldn't really be a reason to reverse it. Uh, and also, if done properly, as I mentioned, this heals in a really durable manner, and you can't even really see the sutures once it heals fully, it would be pretty hard to reverse. Uh, so uh, a poorly done ESG is easily reversed, but I, I would say in general, um, not easily. That's the answer. Now, it can be converted to other things. That's important. So let's say you have ESG lose weight, do really well, but down the line, I've already established that you can, of course, regain after any type of surgery or procedure. This can be converted to other things. Uh, we have to be realistic that obesity is a chronic relapsing condition, and so uh, you know, this at least allows you to move on to other things if needed. Mm -hmm. How many doctors in the U.S. are doing this procedure right now? How many doctors in the U.S. are performing this? Uh, so this is still not done widely, mainly because the technical side, it is um, difficult to learn and master. I would say uh, there are, you know, in general, probably 10 to 15 higher volume centers in the U.S. Uh, there are other physicians performing this uh, at a lower volume, but we're seeing immense interest in, in this currently. Uh, many people want to be trained to do it. Uh, it's just, again, it's, it's not uh, the easiest of things to perform, and that's why you don't just see it at your local hospital. Have there been any clinical studies on the effectiveness of ESG? Have there been clinical studies on the effectiveness of ESG? Uh, there sure have, uh, numerous studies. But the most important one is the randomized controlled study of ESG called the MERIT study, uh, which was just recently published, and that was, this was the highest level evidence looking at ESG compared to a control group. And so this was a nine center study and uh, 200 plus patients. And basically what that showed was ESG led to around just under 50% excess weight loss. Of the excess weight that patients had, they lost about 50% compared to patients following the same diet and lifestyle program who lost uh, just a couple of percent, just about three or 4%. So a huge difference in terms of eff efficacy. That proves that, and because it's a randomized study, that proves that this procedure works. Uh, also in that study, the patients were followed for two years, and the, the, the majority maintained their weight loss for two years, so speaking to the durability of this procedure. Uh, there have been numerous, hundreds of other, thousands of other publications worldwide uh, which show really consistent results with the ESG, regardless of the type of program or practice or, or uh, endoscopist. Next question's from Lisa on Facebook. Can someone with reflux get this procedure and will it make it worse? Question from Lisa on Facebook. Can someone with reflux have ESG? That's, a, that's an important question as well. It's another one of the key differences between ESG and uh, surgical sleeve. So we know that a, a sleeve gastrectomy, the surgical procedure, uh, worsens reflux. In fact, uh, new onset or s significant reflux occurs in 20 to 30% of patients who have a surgical sleeve. We don't see that with ESG. It's, it's, uh, it was a, a, a nice surprise in the field uh, that ESG does not induce reflux. In fact, the rate of significant reflux is maybe 0.4 to 2% if you look at the studies that are available. We really just don't see it much in our program. In fact, we are more likely to see improvement in reflux 
So you, you are still a candidate if you have underlying reflux. If you have a hiatal hernia, we can still perform this procedure. Uh, you'd still be eligible. So that's a definite advantage. So we're cinching our fifth suture now. And we're getting there. Okay. I'm ready for more questions if you have them. Next question is from Sentimental Charles on YouTube. Is there an age restriction on this procedure? All right. Sentimental Charles with the question from YouTube. Uh, is there an age restriction? In our program, we uh, recommend this. Uh, this is just our preference for patients 21 and above. Um, and uh, there is not really an upper limit uh, per se. We perform this procedure safely in patients well into their 70s. Uh, really, it would depend on um, you know, the general health and other medical problems uh, of the patient. But, but uh, that's our general range. If a patient regains weight several years after this procedure, can it be done again or retightened? Can the procedure be retightened after it's been done if someone's regained weight? It can. So that's another advantage of ESG. It can be redone safely. Um, and uh, just like revising a surgical sleeve, we can just go in and tighten an ESG. Uh, and, and we do know that if you've responded really well to the ESG originally and maybe gained weight for whatever reason, uh, you will respond to a, a revision well. Um, for someone who didn't respond well to it to begin with, we might not recommend a retightening. That might be a scenario where you need to move on to something that's more invasive to have a greater impact on you. This is from Nicole on TikTok. Can this procedure be combined with Ozempic, Wegovi, or Manjaro? Can ESG be combined with medications? Ah, that's a great question. I think that's really the future of this field. So we have these great new medications available. Uh, you, you mentioned Wegovi, Ozempic, Manjaro. Uh, great medications by themselves. Um, we have a great procedure here, the ESG. Maybe the weight loss isn't quite the surgical level. So what if we combine the two? So that's really exciting, and, and that's something we are really proactive about in our program for the right patient. If you combine the two, we're seeing surgical level or above weight loss without surgery. I mean, that's quite intriguing. The other benefit there is long-term maintenance. Look, it's a chronic condition. I, I wouldn't tell you that one procedure is going to solve everything forever. It's not possible. But what if we have a procedure, we boost weight loss with medication, and then we maintain with medication long-term, then we've reversed health conditions, improved health, and we're maintaining. That's pretty exciting. Anthony on Facebook wants to know, are the sutures made out of metal and will they set off a metal detector in the airport? Question, will the sutures set off, a, are they made of metal and will they set off a metal detector? So the sutures are a proline, polypropylene, it's like a plastic type material. There is that little metal anchor on the end that I explained earlier on in the procedure. Those stay in place. They look like staples on x-ray. They will not set off a uh, metal detector though. They're visible on x-ray, but otherwise, no, they won't set anything off. They're basically stainless steel. Uh, composition. So they're safe to be in there and they won't cause any issues. Sam on TikTok would like to know, are you personally comfortable with people staying on Monjaro for maintenance long term? Am I personally comfortable with patients staying on Monjaro or I guess other GLP-1 medications long term? I am totally comfortable. That's how they're designed to be used. Um, if you stop them, you're likely to regain weight. I mean, outside of having a procedure, let's just say using them in general, you need to stay on them long term. It's one of the disadvantages of medications is that you will regain weight if you stop them. So if you're starting it, you should plan on staying on it, actually, and that, if you're using it with a procedure or not. Next question. What's the most weight you've seen a patient lose? What is the most weight I've seen a patient lose? It's not all about the weight, but we've had patients, uh, many patients lose well more than 100 pounds, numerous patients, uh, which is always, of course, very exciting to see. But some patients only need to lose 30, and that's an incredible achievement as well. But yeah, we've seen a full range. Here. And we're wrapping up our sixth suture here. Go ahead and cinch that. That's six, right? Yeah, okay. I'll take another question whenever you want. All right, Harry from YouTube wants to know, are there less complications with ESG than you see with a surgical sleeve? Harry from YouTube, are there less complications than with a surgical sleeve? Uh, far less. So I mentioned advantages would be recovery is way quicker. Um, risk is much lower. Uh, the other uh, benefit was the uh, reflux issue that I talked about. But yeah, as far as risk, if you look at published studies, the average risk of a complication is 2% 
with ESG. Uh, that's, that is less, uh, especially if you look long term at surgical complications, uh, it's significantly higher than that. Uh, there are really no long-term proven complications of ESG, but let's say 2% in all published studies. In our program, it's 0.1%, um, and that's really low, and you know, we're, we're certainly comfortable with that and, and, and happy with that. It's not zero, so there are risks. Uh, infection, bleeding, perforation, if these things can happen. You need to be aware of it, but thankfully, they're much, much lower than with a surgical procedure. Cinch. Okay, so we've completed six sutures. And we're, we're getting there. So you can see how the stomach is really sewn together along that wall. And we're coming up near the top of the stomach. I'm going to go ahead and do a seventh suture and possibly an eighth. But we're getting near the end of this. You can go ahead with another question. Heather from YouTube wants to know, how many procedures make you an expert? Question, how many procedures make you an expert? It's a, there's a, that's an interesting question. So first, you have to master this device. That takes probably 25 to 50. Then you have to master the technique. I would argue takes uh, in the hundreds. Uh, but truthfully, you know, we, we reached this point where probably after 500 or 1,000, we really felt we hit our stride with this procedure. So uh, it's like any other procedure. It takes repetition. You have to you know, just do these movements numerous times. But then there's also the patient management side, understanding how patients recover, what's normal, how they should be losing weight, uh, how can we ensure the maximum weight loss. There's all that other aspect of this that's part of managing the patient. It's not just the procedure. Next question is from YouTube. I'm going to do my best not to mess up your name, but I think it's Jay Applebacher. Um, what is the process for someone who lives in another state and can't make it in the office for an appointment? So Jay asks, what's the process for someone who's out of state who can't come in the office for an appointment? Um, so I had mentioned earlier that you know, we have uh, virtual platforms available now, which is really nice. So uh, you know, for our patients who are out of state, so our patient today came from Texas, um, we will generally do a consultation virtually. Um, to get to know them. Our dietitian will meet with them um, virtually. Uh, of course, you come in for the procedure uh, and then can return home safely, and then we can continue follow-up uh, virtually as well. So that, that certainly makes it um, uh, possible and, and easier and more practical for out-of-state patients, but truthfully, we offer the same for our local patients. Uh, having someone come into the office for a follow-up uh, is, is a barrier to follow-up. So uh, we really favor virtual follow-up whenever possible. You, know, you can hop on a, a Zoom visit with your nutritionist uh, when you're on a lunch break or, or whatever you're doing. And so that, that's a really nice thing that we found. What are some of the keys to success with ESG? What are the keys to success? So that, that gets to what I was just saying, the aftercare. It's number one key to success. We know that patients who see us more do better. It's no question. Um, it, again, it allows us to help you. Uh, it allows for accountability, uh, but the more times we see you, the better you'll do by far. Um, so that's pro I, I'll always emphasize that as the most important. You can't just have a procedure and go on about your, your way. Um, the other is the procedure. It does matter. The technique has to be done right. Every suture has to be full thickness. That really does make a difference. Uh, and then I think having realistic expectations. You know, a big part of this is just before having the procedure, understanding what the averages are. You know, how much will you lose? Is that within your goals? Uh, we want to be realistic about what we can achieve uh, and then achieve that goal. Mm -hmm. Avid Camper wants to know on TikTok, would you recommend Manjaro before having a surgical or procedural intervention? Would I recommend uh, medication before having a surgical or uh, ESG procedure? Uh, so, it, you know, it really depends on the person. You know, we, we have these great medicines. They're fantastic. We go the 15% weight loss. Manjaro, not approved for obesity yet, but, you know, maybe 20% weight loss. Uh, it's, it's impressive. Uh, there's some problems with medications. Uh, one, it, they're really hard to get right now. So we go is not being manufactured currently. Manjaro, again, not approved for obesity. Insurance doesn't cover them reliably. So in theory, they're great. They are a little hard, very hard to get. So that's one thing. The other is what I mentioned about you have to remain on them long term. And that's fine if you're willing to do it. It's great if you're willing to do it. But you know, a lot of people, we, we realize, don't want to be on a medication, an injection, forever. Uh, so that's an important consideration. Uh, I guess the other thing is the impact of a procedure is, is different than a medication. Our patients lose, uh, with ESG, 
seven, 15 to 17 percent of their weight within six months. You know, a medication like Wegovy is going to take a year or more to, to induce that type of weight loss. So it has that greater immediate impact. Uh, and of course, you're not relying on a medication to reach that. Uh, so those are all the things you'd want to consider. It's really about, again, what, what's best for you? What are you comfortable with? But you want to look at all your options, whether it's medications, balloons, ESG, surgery. These are all great tools. Keisha from Facebook wants to know, what kind of results do you see in patients with hormonal imbalances like PCOS? What kind of results do we see in patients with PCOS? Um, really common question, important question. The results are really the same. Um, but more importantly, if you have PCOS, we do see improvements in things like ovulation and, and uh, those metabolic components. So uh, it can be effective in helping treat some of the elements of PCOS. Why did you choose to work in this field? Why did I choose to work in this field? Uh, yeah, this field's amazing. So, I mean, you see the technology we're using. It, it's, uh, it's exciting. Uh, we, we love uh, the innovation here, uh, the advancement that's occurring. But really, it's about helping people lose weight. I mean, that's the best. Uh, in medicine, we don't get exposed to, you know, really not trained to help patients lose weight when we come through residency, med school. Uh, and so for me to be able to have these tools to help treat patients it's the best. You know, when someone loses weight, their health improves, their confidence improves, uh, everything improves. And uh, for me, it's immensely rewarding. After the procedure, how quickly can someone start exercising or going back to their normal, normal activities? So how quickly after can someone exercise? So uh, first of all, we recommend uh, immediately starting to walk. So a lot of the early symptoms, all that pressure and gas goes away if you move. So our patient today will get up and start walking later and we'll walk around the neighborhood, go to a store, whatever she wants. We want her moving. And that light activity will continue for the first two weeks. After about two weeks, generally most patients are reaching their protein goals consistently. They're feeling really energetic and then you can start pushing it. And so there are really no restrictions in terms of activity at that point. Um, we don't want someone to overdo it, but really we say push it uh, as much as you're able at that point. It's really important. Uh, in, on this weight loss process, weight loss journey. Next question is from Bella on Facebook. Can you get a hernia from this procedure? Question, can you get a hernia from this procedure? Um, no, this would not cause a hernia. Um, really not a, not a concern that I, I would have. It's I, I mean, there's different types of hernias. Uh, that is one of the risks of a surgical procedure when a laparoscopic procedure is performed, when the stomach, when the, there are incisions made, there's always a risk long-term of hernias, which is why that long-term risk is so much higher with surgery. So that is another advantage of this procedure, if that's what you're getting at. Okay, cinch. We'll do one more suture after this. So we'll do eight sutures total. We're coming up here near the fundus. And so, uh, yeah, one more and we'll be done. This is an easy one from Mama Bear on TikTok. What state are you out of? Mama Bear asking what state we're out of. Uh, this, we're in North Carolina right now. So Cary, North Carolina. We also have a center uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, helmed by the good doctor Daniel Maselli. And so two centers uh, currently is where we're located. Lisa on Facebook wants to know, are there two rows of sutures? Question, are there two rows of sutures? So uh, go ahead and cinch. So I do not perform a secondary row of reinforcement over the initial row. Um, there's really no evidence to say that's of any benefit. Uh, in fact, I think it increases risk. In reality, we want a really solid, sturdy first row, and that's all that matters. I mean, look at this. It's, it's just rock solid. So there's really no room for reinforcements. Uh, and I mentioned I alternate a U and a straight line all the way up to get those almost internal reinforcements is what I'm trying to achieve. That's a very technical question, but I appreciate it. All right, uh, final suture coming up here. So our patient, after, she, uh, after the procedure's over, she'll recover here for, uh, until she's nice and awake. Uh, we'll make sure she's comfortable. She'll then return. Uh, she's staying in a local hotel uh, and then stay in town for a, a couple days. You know, we want to see her back tomorrow. It's really important. We want to see all our patients the day after to make sure everything's going according to plan and also to give some IV fluid. We like to really hydrate uh, aggressively in the beginning so that there's no dehydration, which is one of the risks of a procedure like this because it's so difficult to get liquids down at first. But that gets easier each day. 
So uh, she'll start her protein shakes in two days, and then she'll be uh, feeling great uh, after that. JR Mommy on TikTok would like to know what other procedures do you perform? What other procedures do I perform? So I, I specialize only in the endoscopic bariatrics. Uh, so ESG is the main procedure we perform. Uh, I mentioned revisions earlier. So a large portion of what we, we do is revisions of prior surgical sleeves or gastric bypass procedures. Uh, and then we also uh, specialize in weight loss balloons. Uh, so the Orbera balloon and uh, the SPATS-3 balloon, which is a newer adjustable balloon, were involved in their clinical study. And then we have an entire side of medical nutrition therapy. Patients who don't want procedures need help losing weight, so that's where those medications come into play. And so we uh, manage patients on those, uh, still working with our dietitians in a, in a comprehensive manner. Cheyenne from YouTube asks, do you include the fundus in your procedures? Question, do I include the fundus in the procedures? Well, we're, we're getting to the fundus. We are basically in the fundus right now. And with an ESG, I will stop short of suturing the entire fundus. So that's, that's important. I mentioned why earlier. Basically risk and um, technique intentionally. We want to retain that fundus to serve as a, as a reservoir for food. Okay. Flyboy on TikTok would like to know, I weigh 350 pounds, how much weight could I lose with this procedure? So You're gonna Flyboy have to asks, uh, he weighs 350 pounds, how much weight could he lose? So again, we speak to averages. So um, at 350 pounds, um, the average would be a little bit above 20% body weight, but let's just say average would be about 70 to 80 pounds. Could you lose more? Of course. Could you lose less? Yes. Um, but that would be the average that I would expect. Coming near the end here. A few final questions if you have them. Is there any difference in this procedure in men and women and how they respond? Is there any difference in how men and women respond to this procedure? Um, well, not exactly. Uh, so more women pursue this procedure or weight loss procedures in general. That's just a fact. Men do have a bit of an advantage, uh, I would say, because they have uh, more lean muscle. Metabolism can stay higher longer. They do have the ability to lose more weight or to lose faster. That's not a guarantee at all. Uh, so I would say, in general, the, the average weight loss is quite similar, actually. Next question is, you talk about the importance of aftercare. What does that look like in your program? What does aftercare look like? Yeah, so uh, all of our patients will uh, partner with a dietitian. We have uh, seven full-time dietitians uh, in our program. And so each patient will work with that dietitian, uh, like I mentioned, basically on a monthly basis uh, following the procedure. They continue to work with their medical provider, like myself or one of our nurse practitioners or other physicians. Um, and so that's ongoing care. Uh, really, this is, the goal is long-term care um, so that we can continue to assist our patients as much as possible. Do you know if there's an anticipated timeline for insurance companies covering this procedure? So is there an anticipated timeline for insurance covering this procedure? It's hard to say. It's really hard to say. The first step was FDA authorization for, this, for the procedure, which occurred uh, this summer, just a few months ago. That's a major step. We've been performing the procedure for years with the FDA-approved device, uh, the, which was formerly overstitched. Now the Apollo ESG is FDA-approved. That's really the first most important step. It's a critical step. The next step is uh, it needs a specific procedural code, a CPT code, and that takes some time, and then insurers need to follow after that. Uh, but these things do take time. We see, we're seeing the same thing with medications. Uh, insurers, unfortunately, are reluctant to pay for weight loss procedures and treatments. It's, it's quite unfortunate uh, and very short-sighted. But uh, So I don't have an answer, honestly, but it, it's going to take some time. Uh, we're cinching the final suture, and then we will clean up the stomach a little bit, have a look at the final ESG, and, but that is the procedure. I, I think I can take a last question or two if you have them. Heather from YouTube wants to know, will this procedure work if I have hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's? Will this procedure work if you have hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's? Uh, sure. Uh, assuming that your thyroid is uh, managed well, that you're on thyroid replacement hormone, um, yeah, it would have really be no different. Since okay. Well, let's have a look here. So I'm going to just rinse the stomach. And so the fundus up here has been uh, left untouched. That, again, is intentional. Let's 
clean out the last bit of blood here. There should, of course, be no bleeding at the end of this procedure. All right, I'm suctioning all of that out. If you do have another question, I can, no, we're good, okay. All right, that's fine. So that took about 45, 50 minutes. Eight sutures, so our average in our program is six to eight sutures. I think, you know, that's, that's a good number. Anyone, you know, if, if you're using less than five or six sutures, it's simply not enough. Um, we, you can't expect that to hold the stomach in place uh, in, this, in this configuration. It's, I think that you, you certainly need more than that. So here we can see the sleeve shape. So the scope, it's narrow against the scope, um, not overly tight. And it's actually a much shorter stomach at this point. We take some measurements. This stomach is uh, way shorter than it began. I didn't mention in the beginning, but we're looking at a stomach that's 15 centimeters long. It started around 35 centimeters long, so it's shorter and narrower. And so that's really what we're looking to achieve here. And that uh, would conclude the procedure. So uh, I hope this was informative. Oh, wait, so I think there might be one more question. I was about to Last wrap it up. Last question from Angela on YouTube. Is this procedure general anesthesia or MAC? Yeah, this, uh, is this procedure general anesthesia? It is. So she has uh, an endotracheal breathing tube in uh, and is receiving propofol for sedation. So Jason has probably already turned off her propofol or is about to, uh, and then she'll wake up. Uh, but yes, this is uh, done under general anesthesia. We need to protect the airway from all the secretions and, and blood and the scope and everything going on. All right, we can end with that. So um, I'm going to go ahead and take the scope out. Thank you so much for joining today. Uh, I hope this was informative. Uh, if there are other questions, Go ahead and post those, uh, pop them in the comments, uh, and we'll still field those and answer those over the coming days. Uh, but otherwise, thanks again for joining us, and I hope this was useful.